We just need to do it. Hey folks, welcome back to ACRP Bonsai. And as promised, here is our, oh, got that leader in the way there. As promised, I'm back here with this Red Sentinel, or as uh, the longer version of the name, Twombly's Red Sentinel. And this is in a Kabudachi style. This is another phenomenal pre-bonsai that I got from Ed Clark at Round Valley Nursery. If you're not familiar already, look him up on Facebook. Here, the graft line is really well healed. There's no inverse taper. It's really quite phenomenal. And as we look down here in the plastic, I can see that it's got a really nice root flare. We'll be, just like in our last tree, we'll be digging in and taking a look at the Nabari as well. So before we get started, I wanted to talk about how you develop pre-bonsai like this. If you take a closer look, you can see some of the locations where previous cuts have healed. So that's really nice. Yeah, you got this main trunk line coming up here, and then there's a major cut here where this used to be an elongation. There's another cut off to the side, and then it grew up to this level. There's another cut here, and then the cut last cut from a few years ago is here. And this must have been done sometime in the last six to nine months. So this was cut back probably last fall. You can actually see the years of work by the cut. So you've got at least one, two, three, four, five years worth of cuts. And that's probably more. Uh, we might not have seen all of them, or maybe this lower trunk was allowed to grow for a few years before the initial chop back was made. All right, so here's a close up view so you can see the cuts. This is where it was chopped back. You can see it already has a really nice smooth heel. A little bit further up, there's the second cut. Behind this branch is the next cut. Let me see if I can pan you guys up a little bit. And then we've got a cut here. It's already healing pretty nicely. Can you guys see that? And then there's these cuts up top. Similarly, you're gonna be able to see those same cuts on all of the other supporting trunks. There's a cut here. I don't actually see a cut here, but there's definitely a cut here a cut here, and then the last cut here, and on the other opposing branch there. Looking over here, this little stubby trunk is kind of odd. We're gonna to have to do a lot of repair work on it. There was a major chop done here, and another chop done here. This cut here resulted in a profusion of back buds, and this is super congested. Now, we do want this to heal as quickly as possible, but this is definitely gonna cause inverse taper, so we're gonna to need to clean these out before springtime. Taking a look at this second strongest trunk line, you can see that there's a lot of inverse taper going on here because there were two major branches coming from the same point that were both allowed to extend. We're gonna to have to make a big decision and decide which trunk line we're gonna keep. My gut tells me we're gonna follow this line off here to the right and we're gonna to have to sacrifice this. We can carve this all the way down. I can see the compartmentalized node lines here. This is gonna be able to be completely removed without harming this right-hand side branch line. It's gonna take a few years to heal over this big cut, but it's gonna be worth it in the long run of the tree. Then we have a bunch of other branches, and these come out this way. So when we talk Kabadachi, we're looking at the number of trunk lines, and usually we wanna go for an odd number. It would definitely be very bad luck to have four trunks. Once you get above five, you know, you start losing count, and it doesn't have as big of an impact on the overall design of the tree. As long as you're avoiding that number of four, you're okay. So let's do a count. I definitely say here's one, the primary trunk line, there's two. This guy is three, this one is four, and then this one is five. Circling around to this side, these two here are definitely strong enough to be considered trunk lines, but they're definitely very horizontal in nature, so I'd almost call these branches. Either way we count, either as trunks or as branches, we're gonna add both of these. So that's either gonna be five trunks plus two branches or seven trunks. This little guy here, although it's got that same analogous movement to these other larger trunks slash branches, it's definitely small enough to be in the branch category. Coming up here off screen, we have a few leaders that have been allowed to run. Now for our main trunk line here, I think this needs a little bit more development. So we're gonna let this continue to run. This trunk line here is gonna need a little bit more development. I'd really like to see some of these knobs smooth out. And the only way to really do that effectively is to allow the top of the tree to run. So we're gonna allow one leader. Now you see this thick one here. This is actually on a side branch. We're gonna allow this guy here to start running. This one here is gonna to have to get pruned back so that we don't run into that same inverse taper problem that we've got going on with this trunk line. We're gonna do as much cleanup work as possible. 
while avoiding any of the larger surgeries that need to happen. Those we're gonna do in midsummer. As you can see, I've got this small maple here, and I did cut off a big root that was out of place right here. And then you'll notice a little further up, when this tree branched into two main trunk lines, I cut this off, and this created a nice taper because you've got a branch here with a certain caliper, and then it had a nice step down to this caliper. So you can see where I'm developing the trunk line of this tree. This was from a few years ago, and then this one here, I cut that back last fall. You can see that it hasn't really done much, but die back a little bit. And then I allowed this top branch to run. This is gonna become the new trunk line of the tree. So boom, there's one cut, and you can see it's starting to heal fairly nicely. This one will cut back in June so that we can begin the healing process. This one we're gonna to allow to run all year to thicken up. Eventually we'll cut it back to either this pair of buds here, or there's another one a little bit lower. We may come all the way down to here to keep that compact shape. Meanwhile, I've been developing these small branches. Although I could start this from scratch later in a few years after I get my trunk line developed, I think it's a little more fun to watch the tree grow by building some of these little branches. I've only been allowing them to extend by one bud so that they stay nice and petite. We'll keep you updated on this little tree as well. This is a seedling Japanese maple with green leaves. There's nothing spectacular about it. Pop into the comment section and let me know what you think. Should I continue developing these branches here or should I only focus on the primary trunk lining? Or would you rather see me dive in and do some real surgery on this tree? Maybe convert its leaves to Shinda Shoujo by doing a bunch of thread grafts. Let me know what you think in the comment section. I'm sure you might have noticed this little tree I've got over here to the left hand side. This is a little dwarf character seedling. So it's a seedling grown tree. It's not a named cultivar, but it does have these really phenomenal dwarf characteristics. I'll continue to show you this in future episodes. It's got some issues. It already had a few branch scars when I bought it from a friend. So I'm gonna be removing some of these upper branches and trying to get this back in balance. You can see I've got some wire on this branch here and I did wire out a few of these other branches. I removed that wire a few weeks ago. You can see I'm using that silicone wrapped aluminum to make sure I don't add any additional scars to this tree. It's got really delicate features and I'm excited to see how I can develop this over the years. But dang, look at that next to this Kabodachi. It definitely shows you the contrast between something more like the sumo style Kabodachi and then you've got a little more of a naturalistic. It's got a pretty classic form, you know, with the left, right, left, right branching but it definitely has a more delicate appearance. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is start working on these knuckles. We may have to do work on these a few times, but I definitely wanna start making progress. This broom habit's really interesting. You can actually see that there's three buds. Now this can happen on normal seedling varieties, but you're gonna have this additional branching more common on your witch's broom varieties. If we look at the side, this is a really long branch here. This may end up being too long for the design, but for now we're gonna keep it. We can always make decisions later when we develop these lower branches and they become full, we may make the decision to remove this later, but it's certainly not hindering the design and it's gonna help aid the tree in having a nice full appearance. So the main work we're gonna do here is trim these back to single nodes on these branches that look fairly developed. And then we'll make a decision on whether we're gonna keep or cut off this extension growth. You can see there's a little bud here. We've got a branch here, and then we've got this branch here. So we're gonna rub off some of these little buds. We don't wanna have additional congestion on the branching. Here you can see we've got some crossing branches. Now this branch here is definitely strong, and this is important for the design. So I don't wanna reduce this or cut it off. This is probably the branch that's gonna be removed. I may be able to do some wiring to get this branch over into its own space as well. This is a really stiff branch, but I think I'm gonna be able to squeeze these two together to create their own space. And this branch is quite large. I know that at this point that I'm not gonna need it any larger. I'm gonna go ahead and cut off this extension growth. 
I've got this little pair of toenail clippers. These can be handy for getting down inside of these crotches. There's nothing special about them. I got them on Amazon for pretty inexpensive. I'm going to move to a time lapse to clean up all of the deadwood that's all over the place, and then I'll come back to discuss some of the structural decisions. This is a really problematic junction right here. We've got this little branch going here, and then we have this fairly strong branch, but it's coming from the bottom, and there's a lot of knuckling under here. This is really showing that broom characteristic, tons of buds developing. We actually need to cut this off. You can't see it from this angle, but there's a nice branch coming this way, and then we've got this little branch, and then another branch over here, and they're in a really nice alternating pattern. So this one here with all of that broom character is really just congesting this branch. We need to cut that off. So we're gonna come from the bottom and try to be really careful not to overly damage this. There we go. So we're gonna do a little bit more work here to clean that up and get rid of that inverse taper. And that's gonna heal really nicely over the spring. As I was saying before about these clippers, sometimes less expensive tools can be more effective in these tight little spaces. We definitely wanna get that cut back to expose the cambium layer and help aid this healing process. All right, that looks pretty good. Oh yeah, you can see where I've cut that there. Come around this way. We've got this branch here, and then we've got our other branch over on this side, coming out this way. And then we have this branch here. And so we now we've got that nice alternating pattern. And this thicky, it extends this way and then it branches again. We're gonna make a decision on how much of this we're gonna keep. All these little old nubs need to be trimmed down to allow a nice smooth heel. There we go. There's more of that characteristic knuckling going on back here. We don't want that. We're gonna cut those off. There's a little side bud there, which I think will allow. But I am going to cut this one. It's too congested. I really love these natural downward curving branches. They create a lot of interest. Super cool movement there. Same over here. You can see all these ones that are naturally dipping down. That's going to create a really natural look. All right, so I've been taking a look at this really inverse tapered trunk line, and I've, I've chewed away at this down here. I think I'm actually going to keep both branches. This branch over here has got a really long extension. This is kind of unsightly, whereas these two are a little bit better. So I've decided I'm actually going to remove this entire branch here. Here we go. If I had left all three, I really think that it just would have continued to add to this problem of inverse taper. Sometimes these decisions can be hard, but they're important if we want to make good progress on this tree. That's a massive cut. Worst case scenario, this branch dies and we end up with one trunk line over here. But if we are going to keep it, we're going to have to make these drastic moves. So better now than never. There's no point in putting a lot of time and effort into this branch if it's going to be ugly and have to get removed in the future anyway. I'm coming at it from different angles. So I can use these curved pruners. To try to get this woody mass into a tapered shape. It is going to scar over and create a little bit of bulging, so... Chewing it down is not going to hurt. All right, I think that's about as far as we can go for now. So we've really taken this down quite a bit over here. 
We've also gone in here a little bit to reduce the size of this lump. Maybe just a little bit more here. All right. I think that's about it for now on this branch. We'll see how this develops through the spring and then we'll adjust from there. All right, folks, I wanted to bring you in close to take a look at this really knuckled section that I was telling you about earlier. It's just really a lot here. So we're gonna start by doing some initial pruning. Just try to take out some of these crazy branches. We've really just got a profusion of buds down in here and they're not doing us any good. It's hard to see from the color, but this is healed. This is a healing scar right through here and then it's open wood right here. We really wanna reduce all this extra swelling. It looks like this is the most prominent extension. I think we're gonna to have to cut all of this out if we're gonna to try to turn this into a usable branch. I said we were gonna wait until June to do some of this major work, but I think some of this is gonna be fine. There we go. We gotta start making that progress now or we're gonna set ourselves way behind. This branch over here has got a nice size to it, but it points right up into this next trunk above it. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to keep this. Maybe we can try wiring it way, way down. Let's get all these extra nubs. Now this branch is definitely going to violate that one to two rule if you look at it widely, but because it is so large, even though this branch and this branch really seem to come out of the same node, they're so far apart that we can create the illusion of it coming from somewhere else. And we can avoid inverse taper, even though we're gonna possibly keep this, this, and this as three branches. Yeah, this is really problematic here. All right, I think it's now or never. We just need to do it. I need to switch to my knob cutters. I'm reaching over the top of my phone inside and through my ring light to get at this angle. So there's a little behind the scenes. Can we see that? Hope you guys have a good angle. These knob cutters do a great job getting way down inside of there. You can see the, the live wood and the dead wood it's not going to do any additional harm to the tree if we're cutting away at this dead, dead wood here. Just try to come across the top like that. There we go. We're making some pretty drastic cuts here. That was a little bit scary, but I can already see the improvement of the structure that we've made here. We've really started to create taper that we need in this branch. This is gonna take us a while to heal, but eventually we're gonna have a good branch. If we need to come through later with a thread graft, we can always add another branch back to this spot. I'll keep that in mind later on in the year if we need to be saving some extension growth for thread grafting on this, on this tree. All right, that's pretty good. Now, because we just did all this major work back here, I'm going to keep all this growth and I'm going to let it go to help heal that. We'll, we'll continue refining this branch later, possibly in the fall, depending on how this healing goes. So once again, there's a view when I rotate this so you can get a better look. There's that work we did. It's okay to cut these back in stages. First, you're going to do your major wood removal and then you can come in and start refining the cut. Look at these here. They have a curve. It's really nice. So if the branch that I'm cutting is here, using that concave end, it really helps get into that little area and cut. That's what I'm gonna do right here. I love these little clippers. Okay, I got this little nub here. Let's get rid of that. Okay, so we have one branch coming down this way. We have this strong one going here. 
And we do want the stronger branch. Let's get rid of this one. All right, we're gonna let both of these run this year. Now we've got this primary branch, and we've got this one over here. So really, all these other branches down in this area need to go. All those are gonna do is cause inverse taper. We may need to do a little bit of work in the center area to make sure that it doesn't get too fat. We really delineate these two different branches here. All right, that's pretty good. But I'm really worried that my knob cutter is gonna cut into this top branch. And this is why we need to back off a little bit and take it down little by little. I can even push this branch upward slightly. to make sure I don't hit it with my knob cutters. There we go. Well, that's a really difficult angle right there. I think I can, oh, see, I scraped it with my knob cutter there. It's really critical that you, I probably need to get a smaller pair of knob cutters. These are actually some pretty girthy branches. That's like easily a quarter of an inch. There we go. So we have two opposing branches here. This one and this one are kind of occupying the same space. And this one is one single node. So I'm gonna cut that one off in favor of this back branch here. These are all gonna add extra branches like that knuckled area we looked at last. We're gonna rub all of those off. Now this here, this is an opportunity for a new branch in an open space. So I'm gonna leave that. There's actually two here. So I'm gonna cut the small one and I'm gonna leave that strong one that has, comes out at a nice angle. All right, coming off the top of this, we've got this big branch here and it has some really interesting movement. This is a tough decision because we've got this other branch coming from the same spot on the trunk. But again, back to the idea that we can sometimes break the rules of bonsai. This trunk here is really, really thick. And so if we start pushing these branches into refinement, although that is kind of a flaw, it's possible to keep both of these branches in the design. We can even apply some wire to fill this space creatively. This branch here can come all the way around and twist. And then maybe we'll accentuate that downward bend of these branches to fill in this space. I think we can use these. We still are gonna to need to take care of this grotesque chop here. We are gonna come back through here and get all these wounds covered up with cut putty. These ones had more development anyway, that's gonna look nice. Maybe it'll clean up look here. We did the initial structural pruning, got some of the inverse taper issues taken care of, pruned back some of the elongated growth, except for the areas where we want to leave strength. And now it's time to take a look at the root ball. Same setup here, we've got this tree planted on a piece of plywood so that it could be attached to the wooden box used for shipping. Always taking notes on those techniques. You know, I'm starting up my own maple farm and I wanna know all the best techniques for safely getting trees to customers. I've got a few years while I build up my stock, but I'll be trying to put some of these techniques into practice sometime in the future. Trying not to cut through that soil, that lava can be really hard on our bonsai tools. All right, there's our plywood. These elongated roots love to grab onto this drainage mesh. Looks like there's a lot of really good growth on this side over here. So I'm gonna go ahead and move over to a time lapse and start getting this initial combing out done. And I'll see you guys on the other side. All right.
right, so we definitely have some pretty gnarly roots on this tree. I've already gone through a couple of cycles of power washing and pruning out the bottom. So we're just gonna slowly start working back this root ball. We're gonna be conservative at the beginning like always and see if we can start figuring out what the true base of this tree looks like. I found a couple spots under here where they've already done some root pruning on the base of the tree. And I could see where those had healed over. So that's kind of nice that they did some, at least rudimentary pruning of the base to get that sheen started. So we're definitely on our way to creating a nice nabari here. See there, we got one there where the root was pruned and now it's healed over. This really is an iterative process. You gotta clip it back to allow the soil to come free so that you can clip it back again. You gotta just keep doing this over and over again as you slowly work your way up toward the sheen or the underside of the tree. You definitely got some really nice root development under here. And I've got a mixture of expanded shale, perlite, and a little bit of organics. This is all going right in the pot. Easy does it. And we got it on this plywood plate. That's gonna allow us to start developing that lateral and radial root spread. We're gonna use Akadama. got ourselves set up here in this gigantic training pot. Like I said, it's about 24 inches across the opening. So it's given this tree plenty of space. We're going to make sure we pack this soil all the way up underneath there so there's no air gaps. And this one, like I said, the roots are, they're not horrible, but they're not as good as the candy kitchen. So we're just gonna have to be a little more patient and work with what we're given here. And the whole premise of me starting this channel was to work through some of the common issues that we have here in America on the, on the stock that we have available. You know, we don't have these 100, 200 year old trees readily available. And so we're really, most of the time, the average hobbyist is gonna be working with either a nursery stock tree all the way up to this level, which is a really high quality pre-bonsai. And you're not gonna find much better than this tree here or the candy kitchen in the other episodes without spending thousands of dollars. Um, you know, trees like this might be a lot less expensive in Japan or other Asian countries, but I'm really grateful to have this tree. I, I appreciate the 10 years that Ed put into this thing. It's really, it really does actually take a lot of effort, especially when you're on a larger scale to push these trees along. And that repotting, it really takes a long time. It's really a lot more intensive than doing the branch cutbacks, which can be done pretty easily a few times per, per year. Whereas the roots, you know, it takes it takes a lot of time out of your day. So if you're a larger scale nursery, it's just not feasible to maintain this many pre-bonsai. 
with, with that high touch um, development. All right, we're not quite covered there. I'd like to bring the soil a little higher. I'm gonna mix in just a touch more of this perlite and expanded shale. And I wanna tell you about that as well. So the perlite, you guys can find that at any quality nursery supplier. And the same with the expanded shale. It goes by the common name, what does it say here? Permatil, one time. It's a really great product. It essentially, it's a little bit larger grain than your lava you'll be buying. It's lighter, but it gives that same ability to provide aeration in the soil. It's a nice lightweight lava-like rock. I really like it for my larger plantings. And when you're lugging around a 24 inch garden container, if you're not in the gym, it can be pretty difficult if it's full of heavier particles like the lava rock. All right, I think we're about there, folks. Uh, let's get this thing watered in. See if I can lug this over there so I don't make a mess. Oh, mama.